All right, welcome everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at a very common and maybe even a little outdated web shell called WSO uh, version 2.5. Web shells are something that I come across quite often, and so they're just, uh, I think, an interesting thing to take a look at and really understand the capabilities that they provide. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to hit that subscribe and like button. And of course, if you have any comments, comments are open, and I really appreciate and enjoy the feedback and the interaction. So let me know if you have any questions, suggestions, or um, anything else related to this video. Okay, uh, to get started then, what we're gonna take a look at here is um, the web shell. And we've got the web shell in the browser. The idea behind a web shell is that um, they are going to be web-based. So you're gonna find them as uh, script files for you know, a variety of different web technologies. Uh, PHP being a very common web scripting language, um, this is a PHP web shell. And as you can see, uh, the idea behind the web shell is quite straightforward in that it provides a shell-like or provides shell-like capabilities on a web server. So web shells can certainly be used for, for benign activity, although I would be a little surprised if you're the owner um, or the administrator of a website that you'd be using a web shell rather than just the, you know, the organic tools that you have available to you to include actual shell access to the server. Um, so more likely than not, you're going to encounter these as something that's been used as part of a server compromise, and that gives then a threat actor the ability to access that web server in an illicit manner, as well as then use it to upload additional tools, scripts, and maybe even payloads that they're distributing. Um, so WSO is a, a popular enough web shell. I do encounter it quite often myself in my own research. It is available now through probably illicit channels. It's been leaked. It's available on um, you know, different GitHub repositories and other forums. Of course, if you come across a web shell yourself, then you have the ability to view the source of the web shell, and uh, that can be one way of, of getting access to the source code in the shell itself. Um, so real quick, we'll go over some capabilities here, then we'll talk about the source code, and, uh, and that'll be it for this video. Um, as you can see, logging in, typically gives the the user information um, and we'll talk about login as well in just a moment um, but typically gives user information about uh, the user that they're running under PHP versions um, you know system information such as you know the hard drive status um, and even versions of Linux that they're on the um, file manager is oftentimes then sort of the default page and you'll see it you have the ability to explore the different files within the file system this is the web shell itself. So as I mentioned, you do have the ability to essentially view yourself. And here is just the raw content of the web shell. So if we were you know, accessing this web shell in a, in a real environment, we could simply download this file. I'm gonna use back to go back. Of course, any other file here, we have the ability to, to explore. Uh, you have some basic file navigation commands here, changing the directory, making directory, although in this instance, it's indicating that it currently does not have the permission to write, so cannot make the directory. Execute though, uh, read files as we saw, make files again, not writable though, and upload files, although this is not writable. So it is going to give the user sort of a limited experience based off of the permissions that they have on the server that they've uploaded their shell to. Uh, if we go to the left on these, essentially these tabs, we have security information. So again, just information about the environment, the system, maybe even the ability to try to brute force and or recover some passwords. We have a console. This is going to feel very much like having a terminal open to that server. We can do things like LS. We can do things like, um, whoop, can't tab for autocomplete, but we can do, uh, let's just do a cat on a file. Maybe that wasn't the best, but you get the idea there using this terminal much like we would as if we had an actual shell or terminal prompt open to that system. Uh, an SQL tab gives the ability to connect to a database, in particular to the local host. You could about imagine that if you had compromised a server, you'd be able to navigate the file system, look at the source code. If it's connected to a, a database, likely it is, you're going to be able to recover the information, the credentials to authenticate to that server. Uh, we have the ability to execute arbitrary PHP code. Uh, we have some string tools, so conversions and coding. There's some brute force capabilities. I've never used much of this, but uh, you know, certainly the ability, again, to try to recover credentials and gain access to services that uh, maybe you don't know those credentials for. Uh, network information um, and looks like some 
you know, binding of ports to create a shell or, or kind of a back door. And then there's a self remove capability, which I haven't tested that either. Uh, so that's really it. But you can see that if, um, let's say you're on the other side of this, the defensive side of this, or just, it's just the legitimate side, you're hosting a service and you find one of these web shells in your environment. Um, yeah, you've, you've got problems. Right? I would be very concerned. Now, where do these come from is probably a video and a discussion in and of itself. Uh, but um, there are a number of sources to including, you know, having software already compromised and backdoors with things like web shells. And then, of course, there's always active scanning adversaries looking for infrastructure to compromise and then drop things like web shells. Um, how did I access this? Well, you can see I'm just running a local web server here in Remix. And if we and move those web shell files uh, to the root of my local HTTP servers document root. Boy, I forget the actual like more technical name for that. It's been so long. Um, making sure, of course, that uh, the file it has at least execute permissions. Typically, 755 is the the chmod command that I use. Chmod 755 uh, to get those execute permissions, and that will allow that PHP in the file to go ahead and render. Uh, now, I also mentioned getting access to this, having to authenticate, and um, if we just remove this little hashtag here. Uh, you see if we just simply navigate to that that file, I'm not being prompted for any authentication. And I've discovered web shells have sort of two different states. One is that they require some form of authentication, at least a password, if not a username or password. Others can sometimes just be wide open in which the web shell was dropped on a server and you know just left unauthenticated, unprotected. Now this one does actually require some authentication. And I'm going to use Visual Studio Code here just to look at the, the source code. Um, this is not obfuscated. And so as you scroll through this code, if you wanted to, you could most certainly try to identify all of the functionality and capabilities as well as if there's any authentication. Now, um, you'll also see some anti-analysis or anti-scanning. For example, where is it returning a 404? Well, it's returning a 404 if it finds any of these keywords in the HTTP user agent. Now I said there is um, a password authentication mechanism and it's a little hard to see. So something that I often do in analyzing PHP files, especially if I anticipate there to be a high level of obfuscation or just if I'm not 100% sure, if they come from a very untrustworthy source, I like to toggle word wrap and you'll see with the word wrap, what's happened is that this line here, if not, is set. So let's, let's just add some a little bit of uh, formatting here to make this a little bit easier to see. Uh, if not is set cookie with this value, then it returns a header of 404 not found. So all we need to do in order to pass the authentication here with this web shell is have a cookie with that value. So the way that I did that was to go back to the browser. I just open up by right clicking and selecting inspect uh, the developer tools. And here we have Let's see, there is our there is our cookie value. So if I delete this, let's go ahead and delete. Let's just delete them all. Now if we refresh, you'll see we get a 404. We can go to the network tab and select the web shell. You see there's our, our 404 not found response. So go back to storage. We can add a new cookie. I'm gonna just double click and change the value. Uh, or I, I should say the name. Value doesn't matter. And now when we refresh, right, we pass that authentication. So fairly straightforward here. I'm not going to go through all the code. There is quite a bit here. As you'll see, if you scroll through the code, you'll be able to piece it together if you wanted to. Uh, and again, you'll be able to find these all over the internet, all over GitHub. WSO 2-5, it is prominently here in the title bar, part of the source code. And, and sometimes when it's not readily available through the UI, through that HTML that's rendered, uh, you might be able to find it here, for example, in the source code. So that's a web shell. That's a quick analysis, what it does and how we can identify. And in this case, it's very simply bypass the authentication that's required. So hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe and uh, talk to you all in the next video.